All righty. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual event, Giving Season 2020 a Call to Action for Philanthropists, presented by Bank of America Private Bank. My name is Natasha. I am the marketing manager here at Make a Better Media Group, and I'll be the woman behind the curtains helping to moderate today's event. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to reach out to me via the chat button. We have an amazing presentation for you, so without further delay, I will hand it off to Make It Better Media Group's Editor-in-Chief, Brooke McDonald. Hello, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm Brooke McDonald, Editor-in-Chief of Make It Better Media Group, and along with Sharon Crone, our Vice President, Civic Engagement, who you'll hear from shortly, I want to welcome you to our program in celebration of National Philanthropy Day. I'm standing in this evening because our founder, publisher, and visionary leader, Susan Noyes, is sadly unwell with a complicated case of COVID and pneumonia. She is so very disappointed to miss this, but sends her appreciation and gratitude to our guests, our panelists, and the better team. We all send her our best wishes for a rapid recovery. At Make It Better Media Group, we create purpose-driven lifestyle content that connects our audience to the people and organizations that improve lives and communities. Our ongoing focus on ways to support nonprofits, as well as local businesses, restaurants, retailers, healthcare workers, and other first responders has been resonating with readers more than ever during the pandemic. We continue to be proud of our editorial approach, which prioritizes embedding social impact and meaningful touch points that connect our readers to people and organizations doing good in their communities. And many of those readers have in turn become passionate supporters of causes that we've introduced them to. Our vibrant publishing ecosystem includes websites, print magazines, our e-newsletter, The Better Letter, and our signature events, which, though virtual for the time being, bring important thought leaders together with members of our audience and communities to listen, learn, grow, and give back. Today, we are joined by leading voices in finance and philanthropy and are so pleased to welcome our presenting sponsor, Bank of America Private Bank, with a fantastic program for you giving season 2020 a call to action for philanthropists. We'll begin with a keynote presentation from Bank of America Private Bank, followed by a panel of our philanthropy partners who Sharon will introduce shortly. Before I introduce our keynote speakers, we'd like to extend special thanks to Amy Hughes, Managing Director, Reason Regional Executive, Bank of America Chicago, who also serves on the Board of Directors for Cradles to Crayons, an organization you'll hear from later today. Please join me now in welcoming leaders of the Bank of America private bank team to present our keynote. Patricia Chavez, philanthropic market executive, Misty Sangani, senior philanthropic strategist, and Ramsey Slug, wealth strategies advisor. After we hear from our speakers, we will have a Q&A session. So if you do have a question, please submit it via the Q&A button. And now we'll begin our keynote presentation with Patricia. Thank you, Brooke. I'd like to welcome our guests and thank you for joining us today. Um, Brooke, as you just mentioned, I'm Patricia Chavez. I'm the philanthropic market executive for the West and Central North regions of Bank of America. And it's truly a pleasure to be with all of you today and facilitate this important and quite timely conversation. Giving season is definitely different this year. To me, it feels like giving season started several months ago when the impact of the global pandemic began to unfold. We realized the tremendous needs of, of support that our, that our communities needed, and we certainly appreciated the rapid response um, from donors, frankly. We learned a lot over the past several months, um, especially about our resiliency and our adaptability. With a very crucial weeks before the year end, the conversation today is really to provide you with information that will help you with year end planning. The focus of our discussion for Bank of America today will be from tax planning, impact strategies, family engagement, and you'll hear from our experts. Um, and hopefully we can answer some questions you might have on your mind and share some of the best practices we've been learning throughout this year. I'm delighted to introduce my partners who will be participating in the discussion today. First off, we have Misty Sangani. Misty is Managing Director and Senior Philanthropic Strategist in our National Consulting and Advisory Practice. Her areas of expertise include multi-generational giving, board governance, working with families in their philanthropic journey. Prior to joining Bank of America, Misty was Chief Philanthropy Officer at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. 
And then next we have Ramsey Sled. Ramsey is managing director in the National Wealth Strategies Group and has been with the bank for 27 years, a long time. Ramsey works as a senior wealth strategist. As a former trust and estate attorney, Ramsey assists in the preparation of materials on various tax, financial, and estate planning solutions. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and dive into the, into the discussion today. Misty, we've been down a long road through the global health and uh, economic crisis. We've experienced social and civil unrest where inequality has been at the forefront of many of our discussions. What do donors need to understand about the current state of the nonprofit and social sectors? Thanks so much, Patricia, and good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, let's take a look at the broader framework. This pandemic continues to impact the charitable sector with disruption to service delivery models, preventing organizations from continuing to operate when many, particularly safety net organizations, are most needed. It's important to note that the nonprofit sector is the third largest employer in this country and responsible for essential health, education, and social services. It's not just a nice to have sector, it's a pillar of our economy and our society. So as we enter giving season, we are also focused on the impact of the current economic turbulence on the fundraising efforts of these nonprofits. There is overwhelming need and fundraising challenges with an estimate of one in nine, one in nine nonprofits facing closure. Of course, recent months also have heightened the awareness of the continued impact of racial and gender inequalities, including disproportionate drops in funding to organizations led by and serving people of color. The confluence of these crises, Patricia, create a powerful moment of challenge for the nonprofit sector, and we believe also potential for meaningful and enduring change. These challenges are helping shift the paradigm toward a more conscious and equitable sector and informing new practices for donors. We are seeing more partnerships between donors and grantees, decision-making be more inclusive with community members included in the process and peer-to-peer -peer collaborations among funding organizations. You made a lot of great points, Misty. We've all had to make extraordinary changes very quickly. Um, to your point, and traditional nonprofits have really had to change their model since COVID started. Um, we frankly didn't have a playbook for any of this, and uh, we had to respond to the challenges you just described very quickly. And the philanthropic sector in general has stepped up to the plate. More than, uh, we have a, several examples, more than 700 funders have publicly pledged to increase their giving and to do so with a lot of flexibility and a lot less red tape, which is really important during this time. Within a matter of weeks, hundreds of COVID response funds were up and running at community foundations and other federated giving organizations such as the United Way. And as of October, more than 12 billion has been given to COVID specific causes. Donors have also had to pivot as the world around us changed suddenly this year. Misty, can you give us a couple of examples of how and why funders are adapting and how they've done it so quickly? Absolutely, Patricia. Many donors are reviewing and revising key aspects of their giving from mission to governance to grant making. So they're pulling all levers in an effort to honor and respect the purpose of philanthropy and more broadly, specifically give more flexibly. For example, one of our Family Foundation clients, due to the pandemic and shelter-in-place guidelines, implemented virtual site visits as part of their grant-making due diligence and created a discretionary fund to have the ability to make timely grants for urgent issues and then made a major grant to a top research university's COVID-19 relief fund toward research and treatment and testing for frontline medical workers. Mind you, these additional funds were added to their regular 5% payout, a trend we are seeing where foundations are using the 5% payout as a floor to begin their grant making, not as a ceiling that's capped. So philanthropy is becoming much more values-based than mission-based than ever, before which creates opportunity. 
donors are reviewing their missions for relevance and designing strategic intervention points from there. We talked about mission quite a bit here. Can you help us understand um, why it's so important for them to have a mission during this time sure. especially? Sure, sure. You know, a mission is like an organization's North Star. It's a map. It's not required, but definitely best practice. We know from our Bank of America study of high net worth philanthropy, there is a strong correlation between having a giving strategy and state and mission and having a meaningful impact on the issue, community or organization that the donor supporting. And furthermore, there is an additional sharp correlation between being effective, um, mainly achieving positive impact and personal fulfillment derived from charitable activity. So donors that involve their family members in their giving report that experience is especially rewarding. Like answering questions together, like why are you engaged in philanthropy? What values drive and inform your giving? What issues are important to you? How do you prioritize those issues? What are the community's highest priorities? Indeed, mission defines what is most important to a donor. Yeah, and the bright side of being um, in the pandemic, if there's any silver lining, is the fact that families have been spending quite a bit of time together during this yeah. time and had a lot of time to reflect on some of these questions that you're mentioning. And Misty, you have a great job. I, uh, I know you've been in the philanthropic industry for a long time and you work with many donors in your philanthropic strategist role. What best practices can you share and what are donors doing right now to maximize their impact? Absolutely, many of our clients are reviewing and revising their processes, like I mentioned, with a heightened emphasis on efficiency and effectiveness and getting funds into the right hands quickly um, by deploying what has long been practiced um, and urged as best practice to be more grantee centered. For example, we're finding that clients are minimizing due diligence um, on the front end by streamlining application processes, particularly if they've already granted funds to this organization. Accelerating payments, really getting the money out the door quickly. Um, extending and renewing multi-year grants so an organization doesn't need to apply over and over again um, with the same information. Um, and this one is key, really moving from restricted to unrestricted grants. Um, in this moment of constantly changing circumstances, what nonprofits need most are unrestricted general operating dollars. Again, unrestricted general operating dollars. You provide the most flexibility and support to nonprofits when your grant comes with no restrictions. These are the dollars nonprofits need as they suddenly discover, for example, that they need to buy laptops for all staff so that they can provide virtual counseling. And finally, communicating assurances to grantees. Listen to your grantees. If you have an existing relationship with nonprofits, ask if they can spare a couple minutes telling you what their highest needs are and what they are seeing and hearing in the community. Yeah, I heard a lot. Uh, unrestricted. Very important during this time. And Missy, as we continue to live with and adjust to the very real external pressures, whether it's the pandemic, the economy, um, or just the call to action uh, for social and racial justice and equity, I think it's fair to say the scope and scale of the needs that philanthropy can tackle, it can be daunting right now. There's so much good work to do. It can sometimes be hard to know where to start and how to have the greatest impact. Talk about how donors are incorporating equity. I know you've studied this quite a bit into their giving. And why is that so important today and, and also going forward? Absolutely, Patricia. This, this is of critical importance as donors assess giving through a racial equity lens. We encourage clients to analyze and evaluate their due diligence process. So take a look at the leadership and mission of your grantees. Studies show that less funding goes to non nonprofits with diverse leaders. Additionally, those grant dollars have historically come with more restrictions. 
Black-led nonprofits are consistently funded at lower levels than white-led organizations, even when focusing on the same issues. Between 1999 and 2009, only 1.3% of all philanthropic dollars went to Latinx communities, while those same communities represent 18% of the U.S. population. And one more statistics for you, only 0.3% of foundation grants target Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, even though they are the fastest growing demographic in most states. So take a look at your grantee or gift portfolio and see who is missing and what great organizations you might be able to support. And that might look a little different than those you've are previously funded. And finally, just a quick note, the grantee's budget size also helps these assessments. If you're always funding the larger organizations, it may be a sign their application outreach or evaluation criteria are screening out community-based or startup organizations. I always appreciate your insights here, Misty, and I know it's a topic near and dear to our hearts and something we could continue to talk about. I want to reemphasize your comment and advice about how there are so many great organizations out there doing impactful work. My takeaway here is we all need to look and see who's missing, who else needs support. Uh, so thank you for those comments. And let's transition over to Ramsey and get your take on, on some of this, Ramsey. We know donors are making their gifts right now or even evaluating what to do next. In fact, many people on this call are reflecting on some of Misty's comments and trying to make some decisions with important tax implications in mind. Ramsey, what should donors be thinking about doing right now? Well, thanks, Patricia. You know, the good news is they've got plenty of options. So no matter how they wanna to respond to all these various needs, there's a lot of different ways to go about doing that. We are all obviously familiar with writing a check or today, uh, you know, more, more commonly picking up the phone or going online, whatever, and making a donation that way. Uh, and that is obviously the easiest and the most common way to make a charitable donation. Unfortunately, it's also the least tax efficient way to make a donation, but it's still the most common. So we know from talking with our clients that tax motivation is not really particularly important to them, but they do at the same time want tax efficiency. They give to charity because they're charitable, but they do want tax efficiency in doing that. Now, there's a lot of options here. There's a lot of different ways to go about it, but it all comes down to one of three things. First, there's direct giving. We've already talked about that. It, that is where we give money or other assets directly to an operating charity. Again, the most common way to do that. Uh, the second way to do it is what I call indirect giving. And that is where we give money to a charity but it's not really an operating charity. It's sitting there as a fund. And there's the two most common ways that that happens would be with a private foundation. And that is a, an individual or family sets up their own foundation. They fund it with money. Uh, that money could go on and be handed out the very next day, or it may be handed out two or three generations down the road. Uh, foundations are all about control. And there's control over investments, control over future grant making, uh, but that comes with a price, and the price is that there is the least amount of tax advantage going in, and there is the most burden as far as operating rules going forward. The other common example would be a donor advised fund, and we know those as DAPs. And uh, the, the thing about a DAP is that it's really all about ease. They're easy to set up, they're easy to operate, you really don't have to do anything, uh, and, and they're, they're just really about ease. You can still accomplish a lot of things you want to do with the foundation, but it's just done very easily. And the nice thing about it is it has the greatest tax advantage possible because it's treated just like a public charity. And finally, there's split interest giving. And that is where we take an asset or a pot of assets and we put it into a trust, the most commonly. That trust is gonna have a charitable beneficiary and a non-charitable beneficiary. The most common examples there are charitable remainder trust. That's where we put an asset in the trust we have a stream of income come back to us, and at the end of that period of time, which could be a term of years or for life, whatever is left over goes on to the charity of our choice. The flip side, optically, not technically, uh, would be called a charitable lead trust, and that's where we put the asset in the trust, 
We pay a stream of income to the charity for a period of time. And after that's over, it comes back into the family. Now I will tell you, I made those sound really, really simple. But there are 11 different types of charitable remainder trusts. There are four different types of charitable lead trusts. So they're not really, really simple. And you need to make sure the one that you pick, uh, you're working with a really, really competent advisor who can help you pick what is right for you and what works for you and your family and to carry out your philanthropic goals as well as your financial goals. Now, the other thing that's important here is asset selection because not all assets are created the same. And we, we, you know, we've talked about cash, uh, public stock, those are both easy to give. They are also uh, really easy for the charity to receive. Charities love to receive cash uh, because they don't have to do anything else with it. With stock, they have to sell it, that's pretty easy. But other assets get a little trickier. Actually, though, for the donor's point of view, the best asset to give is an appreciated asset. And if you do that correctly, you score what I call the charitable trifecta. You get, if it's done correctly again, you get a fair market value deduction for your donation. You don't have to pay tax on the appreciation, either the capital gains tax, which is number two, and number three is you don't have to pay the health care surtax. So you have three benefits to the donor uh, as opposed to just giving cash, which is actually an after-tax asset. We have one other thing. We have a special rule this year. It's part of the COVID uh, stimulus. So it, there were actually three rounds of stimulus. The third round gave us a special rule. All charitable contributions, all deductions for the contributions are limited by a percentage or limited to a percentage of your adjusted gross income. This year, for cash gifts to operating charities, that's taken away. You can go all the way up to 100% of your adjusted gross income if you give cash. Now, you can also stack some other things in there. So again, you want to make sure that you've got somebody on your advisory team who knows these rules. They're tricky. I deal with them every day, and I have to look things up every day. The first thing I had to do this morning was do some research on a particular charitable rule. So. It, it, there, there's a lot going on there, and I made it sound a lot simpler than it is. Uh, so make sure that you've got somebody involved who can help you out with all of those various rules. So Because you hate to get a letter from the IRS for any reason. You sure hate to get a letter from the IRS that says, hey, guess what? Your deduction that you meant well with, you don't get to take it. You don't want to have that situation. Absolutely. And Ramsey, I know you've been doing a lot of homework uh, since the election, right? There's a, there's a lot of information and a lot of anticipation about what to do next. Uh, can you give us a little sense of uh, the tax implications from the election, maybe what donors should be thinking about right now and what they should do in terms of their action before year end? Yeah, you'd think if you have an election, thing would get easier. We had a lot of speculation leading up to the election. Then we have an election and things got harder. Uh, because we, we know less. We still don't know the exact outcome of what's going to be. We actually won't know that final outcome when, in the Senate election until after the first of the year, which makes it even harder to do your planning this year because things are really, really close. But it's possible that income tax rates could go up. If they do go up, that normally would make a deduction for charitable contribution that much more beneficial. But at the same time, there would be two other caps put right on top of that very same deduction. One of those we've had before that's called the phase out of itemized deductions. And we've had that through the last four administrations, depending on who was in the, in the White House. We had it, then we didn't. We had it, then we didn't. We may have it again. The other one we haven't had yet, it's been proposed, and that is to cap, if you make a certain amount of income, cap your deduction as if you were a 28% taxpayer, mm -hmm. even if you were a 39.6% taxpayers. So uh, it can get kind of confusing if all those things get put into place, but we just don't know exactly what's going to happen. Now, what, all, what I will really say is it's a big if. It is really a big if at this point, whether any of that takes place, and I don't mean to get political about any of it, we just don't know yet, which makes it really hard. So if I'm sitting there, if I'm sitting around the table with the family at Thanksgiving or or whatever holiday that you, that you sit around and talk with your family, and we're saying, hey, we're gonna make a charitable deduction, either a really big one this year, or we're gonna make it next year. Let me tell you, I'd make it this year. 
And the reason for that is I know what the rules are today. I don't know what the rules are going to be next year. But we may not know until late in the year what the rules are going all the way back to January 1. So don't wait. If you're going to do it, go ahead and get it done now. I think that's fantastic advice, Ramsey. A key takeaway for me here is the importance of sound, surrounding yourself with some good advisors. This is very technical and obviously we don't want to make any mistakes. So thank you for that, that guidance there. Misty, let's transition back to you for a few more minutes of our discussion. A common question that comes up out of these planning conversations is always around philanthropy and how someone engages the entire family. Can you talk about how the families you've worked with do this and how they do it well? Sure. Uh, philanthropy is a great way of sparking intergenerational discussions of values and family legacy. Um, as Ramsey just noted, when you're sitting around the Thanksgiving table, these are the issues that, that spark a lot of conversation and, and interest. For example, I re we recently worked with a family foundation um, that's over 20 years old. And the first generation founders were eager really to engage their grandchildren in the foundation. But discussions and process had gotten a bit stalled. People's lives were busy. The founders' daughters um, already were actively serving on the foundation board, um, but they were struggling to capture the attention of six grandchildren all of whom were in their 20s, leading busy lives in college and, and you know, work, new work situations and scattered across the country. So that's where we stepped in to help. And the first step was really speaking one-to-one -one, um, with all three generations of the family. Um, and I've got to say that was the most exciting. Um, and then we you know, facilitated a two-day virtual meeting um, across six time zones. Um, the meeting was wrapped in family traditions and memories and included a lot of opportunity to share philanthropic passion. So now we find that the grandchildren have a much clearer understanding of the foundation's history um, with new written foundation roles and responsibilities that grandchildren have a clear on-ramp and open invitation to participate. And most of all, the family's intergenerational bonds were nurtured and strengthened. Um, and you know, their goal of seeking the next generation um, really happened. Well, Misty, thank you. And you know, we're gonna have to wrap up this portion of our, our discussion. And I know we're gonna take some Q&A in a little bit. So just to wrap us up here, I'd like to thank Misty and Ramsey for sharing their insights with us today. And they'll be around for questions. To our listeners, we appreciate you giving us your time this afternoon or this evening. I'm in the West Coast, so it's still afternoon for me. And to Better Media for hosting this virtual event and having us today, we really appreciate everything. We hope the conversation will help guide decision-making for year-end giving. And we, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't miss, mention and how hopeful I am about the promising news around the vaccines that are on the horizon and the new optimism about the, what the future can hold for all of us. So there's lots of good things happening. With that, I look forward to hearing from our next presenters. And Sharon, I'll hand it back to you. Great. Thank you, Patricia, Misty, and Ramsey. What great encouraging words. So inspirational. And there's just really a lot to consider for this season. I will mention audience questions have been filling in, and we will address those at the end of our program. So you feel free to go ahead and submit those as we segue now to our esteemed philanthropy panel in this second segment. So as Brooke mentioned, I'm Sharon Crone, Vice President of Civic Engagement with Make It Better Media Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome our philanthropy partners with us tonight. And they'll take about five minutes each to share a bit about their organizations, specifically the challenges they faced over the past year, ways that they have pivoted, and most importantly, goals for the year ahead and how our audience can help maximize their support. So first with us tonight is Shelley Pattonod, president of the Founders Board of Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Next is Shoshana Buchholz Miller, Executive Director of Cradles to Crayons in Chicago, and Selena Roldan, Chief Executive Officer, American Red Cross, Greater Chicago, and Tiffany Circle. So, Selena, why don't you get us started with the conversation? 
Thank you, and thank you so much for having me this evening. So, again, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. My name is Solana Roldan, and I am the CEO for the Illinois Region of the Red Cross. Um, I'm a social worker by training um, and by heart, uh, but I joined the American Red Cross in 2016, um, and it's been truly one of the greatest honors of my life to be able to join an organization whose mission is literally to alleviate human suffering uh, during times of disasters and emergencies. We carry our mission through the power of our volunteers and the generosity of our donors. And the American Red Cross has 50 regions of the Red Cross nationally, and the Illinois region is the second largest region in the country, serving 12.4 million people in our region, which obviously also includes Chicago. We respond to disasters, we support our uh, services to armed forces and military and veterans families and collect life-saving blood. We do this with over 3,200 volunteers. 90% of the workforce at the American Red Cross are volunteers. And because of the generosity of our volunteers who give of their time and their commitment to our mission, we are able to say that 90 cents of every dollar donated to the American Red Cross goes directly to our humanitarian mission. In the Illinois region of the Red Cross, we respond to over 1,600 disasters locally within our region, and we help over 12,000 people every year impacted by local disasters, sometimes in the form of floods, but primarily in the form of home fires. Home fires are actually the number one disaster that the American Red Cross responds to every single year. Hundreds of our Illinois um, volunteers also help support disasters across the country, as we saw this year with natural disasters. And the American Red Cross is also responsible for 40% of the nation's blood supply. One of the most powerful things that I learned when I started at the American Red Cross was that someone needs blood every two seconds. And so we work every year and the Illinois region collects over 114,000 units of blood in our region every single year. So what has this year looked like uh, for the American Red Cross? Um, COVID does not change the American Red Cross mission. It just changes how we carry it out. We are still doing everything that we can do to support communities and help people recover from disasters and making sure that people are safe and healthy during this uh, pandemic. The United States um, saw an unprecedented number of disasters this year. Um, I've only been with the organization for four years, but many people that I work with never would have thought we would have gotten to the Greek alphabet when we were naming storms and hurricanes at this point of the year. Um, so Red Cross teams have been working around the clock to get to communities, to get to the, make sure that they have the aid and support that they need to recover from disasters. The Red Cross is supplying blood products for patients that are in need of transfusions, um, that have gone through cancer treatments, that have been in accidents. Um, it is so important, especially right now, as we're hearing about our city or state starting to shut down, blood donation is an essential service. So it continues regardless of those restrictions that start to happen about or as we start to hear them at the city and the state level. So we still need people to be hosting blood drives and we still need blood donors to be coming out and donating blood as well. We are also collecting, and it's been an honor to be able to be collecting convalescent plasma um, from individuals that have fully recovered from COVID-19 to help with treatment for the most seriously ill patients. Um, this past October, I had the honor of joining thousands of Red Cross volunteers that uh, went out and deployed across the country, starting in the, the summer with Hurricane Laura, with West Coast fires, um, and I was able to be able to go to Oregon and support our continuing response to the wildfires there. Um, this was my sixth deployment. Um, in the past four years that I've been with the organization. I, I primarily deploy in the form of supporting our Latino engagement initiative for the Red Cross, which is a dedicated group of staff and volunteers with the Red Cross that goes out specifically on di disasters to make sure that our services are bilingual, bicultural, and are there to make sure that all people can have access to the services and supports of the Red Cross during a disaster. Um, I was able to see the Red Cross um, helping thousands of people that have lost their homes. Now they're staying in hotels instead of staying in our shelters. They're having meals delivered instead of coming all together to have meals given by the Red Cross. And um, they're still receiving our help, mental health, to help support them and recover on the worst day of their life. And um, it was the first time that I could not hug someone during a time that I deployed, but I really saw that you can still deliver help and hope even when you're wearing a mask. So um, again, I'm just so grateful to be able to be here with tonight, to be with my esteemed colleagues, and just so grateful to all of you that have supported the Red Cross and our work across the country.
Thank you. Thank you, and we appreciate your deployed leadership. That's significant. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Shoshana. We'd love to hear a little bit more about how Cradle to Crayon Chicago is responding. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you everyone for having me today. It's a, it is an honor to be on this panel with this amazing group of leaders. Um, and we at Cradles are very proud to be here. Um, we're kind of the baby of the, of the group. Um, when we were planning for this program, they were, uh, both Selena and Shelly were talking about the hundred plus years of history that their organizations have. We've only been in Chicagoland for four years, but we're really uh, proud to be part of the community and to offer what we can. Um, for those who don't know, we provide new and gently used clothing and necessities to children from birth to age 12. So we provide things like um, outfits and winter coats and winter boots, and um, but we also do backpacks and school supplies and coats and toys and books and diapers and wipes and the whole gamut. I, I say that we provide everything a child needs with the exception of food and furniture. And our goal really is to address something that we call clothing insecurity. So clothing insecurity is the lack of access to adequate, appropriate um, clothing. And it is kind of a hidden insecurity. People know about food insecurity and housing insecurity, but there is very little resources for families um, who don't have access to these items or don't have the funds to, to get them. There are not a lot of places where they can get um, this, a sweater that fits or new boot, boots for the winter, and that's where we come in. And then we do that by collecting items from the community. So people give us gently used items and new items. They all come to our warehouse, which is um, in the Logan Square area of Chicago, and they are sorted in normal times by um, tens of thousands of volunteers who come through our doors because our, our philosophy is quality equals dignity. So we want to make sure that everything a child receives, they're going to be proud to wear, they're going to be excited about, and that all the puzzles have their pieces and all the toys work. So we really rely on volunteers to create ultimately customized packs for the children that we serve. And we do, we reach out to the children through partnerships. So we are partnered with over 50 social service agencies in Chicagoland, those boys and girls clubs or YMCAs, um, they order from us, the social worker will order from us for their particular child, and then we will fill that order and provide it to that child. So it's a very um, customized and hands-on process. And when we talk about how people have been impacted during the pandemic, I know that everyone on this call has had to change things. Um, this has been a very disrupted, disrupt, big disruption for our model when we rely on tens of thousands of volunteers and we rely on donated product. Um, um, and we, you know, are trying to reach people all over this all over the city. The pandemic has been a challenge, but we've really tried to make the changes that we could because we know that the need is so great. And to give you a sense of the need, um, before the pandemic, there were about 225,000 children in Chicagoland who would use our services. Um, we served um, a year ago. We served 100,000 kids since April, so the past eight months, we've served 140,000 kids. And so we know, and, and those demands are just increasing. So what we've done is we've really focused on um, providing the most needed items that our partners tell us um, that their families need. So those are things like diapers, wipes, hygiene supplies, those items were hard for people with lots of resources to find during the beginning of the pandemic and unfortunately are becoming harder now where things are beginning to lock down. Um, people would go to multiple stores. The families that we serve don't have time or resources to do that and also um, probably don't have the funds to buy those diapers and wipes. And those of you who have children know that a diaper is not a nice to have, it's a need to have. So we have, we were provide, we created an emergency fund and were able to bring in um, thousands and thousands of diapers. In fact, we've um, distributed over a million diapers since April um, to families who need them, along with other things like um, those basic needs of hygiene supplies and school and art supplies. At the same time, kids are still growing, so we still need to be providing clothing for the next season, and we are doing that, um, and, and we're doing it with the help of volunteers. So we had to alter our model, but we are still taking volunteers and just in smaller and socially distanced ways. 
Um, and then we're able to provide things in kind of bulk and also in our custom in the customized model. Um, and I would just say that we have been so proud and so grateful for the Chicagoland community that has really come out to support these families that we're trying to serve. Um, we, you know, we have seen the, as I mentioned before, the increase in demand, our diaper demand is up over 600%. And at the same time, we've been able to meet those demands because people have been generous. People have understood that the need is out there. And they've been, if they haven't been able to give their financial resources, they've given their gently used items, they've given their time to come into the warehouse. There's many different ways to give. And we're so grateful that we live in a community that's generous and able to do that. Sharon, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Shoshana. And I'm just going to pause and mention here, we have great editorial resource on all three of these organizations. In fact, coming up next, Shelly Patnod, we, we have a wonderful feature on Lurie that just went up today on our website, so I'll encourage our readers to be um, looking for that, but certainly great stories on Cradles to Crayons and American Red Cross activity. Shelly, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about what's going on with Lurie in addition to the story that we're posting now? Give us yeah, an update. Thank you, Sharon, and a good evening. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here tonight to represent the Founders Board of Anne and, Anne and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. I've been on this board for over 10 years, and I like to tell people that I am the first second generation president as my mother was about 20 years ago. So it very special and near and dear to me. Um, the Founders Board is a group of approximately 100 women we're all dedicated to supporting the hospital's mission of providing the most advanced and compassionate health care for children and their families. Uh, we pride ourselves on providing this steadfast support based on four pillars of our mission. We advocate, we educate, we fundraise, and we serve. I mean, I know my fellow panelists have joined me this year in reflecting on what matters and what inspires us moving forward. While none of us can really predict uh, the future nowadays, I do know that the members of the Founders Board will always be committed to providing a healthier future for every child. Through the turbulence of this last year, the Founders Board has steadily worked to provide the resources for this hospital, um, their needs to fulfill its mission. During a normal year, we would typically host three events to drive the bulk of our fundraising. We were and we have been extremely successful with these events. Uh, they ran like what I like to say is a well-oiled machine. However, we, like so many other nonprofits, have now had to creatively pivot. So in March, as the pandemic overtook us, we were preparing for our 60th annual Pro Amateur Golf Championship. The Founders Board responded to that change by um, pivoting to conduct a virtual paddle raise in June at the time we were originally holding our event and we postponed our golf tournament to September. Through digital media and, and true ingenuity, we were able to reach more people than just those under the tent. And I'm proud to say that we amazingly had the highest net revenue in the history of the Pro-Am. Also this year, we needed to change our Winter Wishes cocktail celebration to a safer event uh, that captures the same sort of revenue that was budgeted. We moved to um, a Winter Wishes holiday season drive-in movie experience at Lincoln Yards in early December. Our corporate sponsors are not only able to bring their families to a socially distanced and safe night of fun, but they will also participate in a virtual career day we are hosting at the end of January. They'll be mentoring alumni students from our Healthy Communities Workforce Education Program from the hospital. So why do we continue to reimagine our efforts? It's because the Founders Board is truly committed, uh, not just to Lurie Children's, but to all the kids of Chicago. We recently made a $5 million commitment to the Patrick M. Magoon Institute for Healthy Communities at Lurie Children's. It was named in honor of the hospital's former CEO, and the Magoon Institute will advance community-focused initiatives that truly help children grow and thrive in the communities in which they live, learn, work, and play. It is our compass that we will bring the hospital into the heart of the community. And I like to always quote our, our chair of pediatrics, Dr. Matt Davis often says, a child's zip code has as much impact on their health as their genetic code. I say that again, a zip code has as much impact as their genetic code. Uh, I am, I'm astonished by that, but it is truth. And 
With the Founders Board commitment and all of our support, the Magoon Institute will strive to advance healthy equities for Chicago's children. So I thank you for the honor of being here tonight uh, with my esteemed colleagues. Um, I think I say for all of us that we understand the nonprofits um, are, are struggling for philanthropic dollars now, and I think partnerships in, in cities are important and, and reaching out to your donors and, and understanding what they want to and being a true partner. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Shelley. What an inspiring message. And again, I think our audience probably is catching on to the fact that um, we prioritize social impact on our website, and it's because of stories like these that we just need our readers to be know to learn and hear about. Uh, we want our readers to be informed and get upset about the zip code thing. We want them to get excited. We want them to be dis um, disturbed and moved, and ultimately to get involved and support nonprofit organizations around them in a meaningful way. So that thank you all three of you, Shoshana, Selena, Shelley, for that um, inspiring insight. I um, want to move into our Q&A portion um, and, and just encourage our audience again to use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If you haven't already done so, please submit your question for our panel. And while those are coming in, Misty, one thing that you referenced is this idea of diversity and disparity of funds distributed to Latin-led and Black-led organizations. We have a listener tonight, Allison, who works for a nonprofit that is Black-led, and currently they do not emphasize that in their proposals. So Allison is asking an important question. Should they start emphasizing that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it is um, with, with the data out there, um, with the research that we've done, um, donors and family foundations are hungry to learn um, and to hear those voices, um, particularly from uh, Black-led, Latina X-led, um, Asian-led, Asian Pacific Islander-led, um, Native and American um, LGBTQ, um, you know, all of these voices need to be heard. Um, and um, absolutely, if you're a leader in there, you know, let the world know. Thank you, Misty. And I, I'm just going to do it as a second question in your direction, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned donor response. So I want to build on that. Specifically, you talked about how donors can respond and are responding to current conditions of economic and health crises, so it's social and civil unrest. So as we move forward, how can donors approach both these pressing needs as we, you know, as they're implementing longer term grant making strategies? Yeah, we're, um, Sharon, we're really seeing clients be very creative about this. Um, one example that comes to mind is a family um, that we've been working with that want to continue their traditional grant making strategies for the long term, you know, follow their strategic plan. Um, but at the same time, they're creating a parallel process. Um, and this parallel process, they, um, you know, really are looking at um, having kind of um, uh, quick or, or quarterly meetings um, that are more ad hoc, where they can be responsive, and whether that responsiveness comes from a discretionary fund um, for emergent needs like wildfires or, um, you know, other uh, disasters, and unforeseen events. So, so a lot of our clients are kind of having this um, both and um, reaction that we want to have what we're doing for the long term. Um, as I mentioned, keep that North Star, um, but be flexible um, to be able to respond to a community's needs. Thank you. Brooke. Thanks, Ms. Steve. Yeah, we are seeing some great listener questions coming in. And just before we do that, I would love to just ask, um, take it back to Selena for a minute. Um, Selena, we've heard from you and your colleagues about the challenges, obviously, that 2020 has presented for nonprofits. How Can you talk to us a little bit about how the range of crises that we've seen this year has impacted the donations the Red Cross has received and 
relies upon to execute its mission. As we know, um, your colleagues will be facing similar challenges and we'd love to hear from them too. Sure, so, um, you know, again, the American Red Cross and certainly in the Illinois and Chicagoland area um, has some of the most generous individuals, generous companies and businesses that are always willing to give. You know, I was um, with the American Red Cross during 2017, where we had all of those back to back disasters as well. And I just, I was just astounded every single time we went back to say there's more people to serve, disasters are still happening, and people still continue to step up and to give. Um, clearly, though, there's been a financial impact on many companies, many individuals, which then also impacts what, you know, individuals also have to give. Um, a lot of our work has also become more complicated and more expensive in terms of, of how we're able to carry it out and do. So, for example, a blood drive, um, you know, our blood drive needs now additional space, additional PPE, um, you know, additional safety protocols and things that need to be put in in order to be able to carry out that blood drive safely. Um, thousands of people that this year that lost their homes and normally could have been in a large gymnasium or a school or church. Now they're in individual hotel rooms. That's incredibly costly. Um, and so we're continuing to do that. And the generosity of the American public is still stepping forward to do that. But it is absolutely been more challenging during this time where there's such significant need across the country. Well, it's very encouraging to hear that people are still really stepping up. Shelly, we've heard about how you've pivoted to reimagine some of your fundraising initiatives. Can you talk a little bit more about the changes that your boards and organizations are making to respond to the fact that donors and corporations and foundations are all facing this financial uncertainty while, as Selena just said, philanthropic needs continue to increase? Certainly, Brooke. I think um, Selena makes such a good point that um, it, the 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 problem is the need has gotten increased. It, it was always there, and it's it's been all of my partners here know that that there's social disparity in the city of Chicago and in, in all of our cities, um, and and that we're working to to rectify that. But now, given the COVID um, pandemic, it it has really magnified it. Um, I was on a meeting today, Brooke, that spoke about the positivity rates and death rates, and if you take just in the city of Chicago, the African-American positivity rate at 14.2, where whites were 12.8, and yet the deaths of African-Americans were more than twofold, and, and Latino was right behind that. That doesn't directly affect our children, but that affects them in the sense that their mothers and fathers and grandparents have died and passed away. And, and the social distancing that they can do, uh, or at least we can do, they can't necessarily because of given the parameters of where they live. Um, I think that that puts more pressure upon us as philanthropists to, to raise that money where, um, you know, we're a safety net hospital, 55% Medicaid. Um, and we have about 125 million of uncompensated care that Lurie Children's covers. So, we on the fundraise, well, fundraising side really have our work cut out for us. And I think I would go back to what Misty says, which is the most important thing of this evening is to meet your donors where they are, to ask them what their needs are, to ask them what their mission is, because I can tell them what my mission is and what the hospital's mission is, but if it doesn't align, then we're not being a partner with them. So I found the largest piece of pivoting is not to rest on your laurels. I think we've gone through some years of great, um, you've seen a great fundraising and, and donations and, and support, and now that's a bit fractured. So I think um, we also can't see each other in person, which is really hard for all of these events. I think of all the civic, all of the art events that cannot happen. Um, and so how do we, we translate? And I think it's a little bit of, it's like making a big stew. It's a little bit virtual. It's a little bit social distance, like, you know, we can do a drive-in. And then I think it's a lot of these sort of Zoom conversations where we ask our donors, how can we help you? and your employees um, and, and be partners in the city of Chicago. Because uh, I, I, the best part of this is I have two new partners in, in Selena and, and Shoshana um, that I hope that we can collaborate, so. Terrific, and actually thanks for, thanks for that introduction. Because Shoshana, here's a question for you. How have partnerships allowed your nonprofit to leverage impact? 
I mean, I think that we, that is, that's the perfect lead in to that question, right? Shelly just um, raised it. You know, we as an organization rely completely on partnerships to be able to reach the kids that we serve. So we aren't directly serving any families, you know, from our warehouse. We're doing it in partnership with organizations um, like, like Lori's Children's or other, or the YMCA or a school, um, because the, they are, the kids that we're serving are getting services there and we can provide additional services so we're have offering a more holistic um, vision for these families um, that has always been the case in the way that we work but I would say that during the pandemic one of the beautiful parts of it has been the way we've been able to connect and work with other non with other nonprofits and with other organizations that we didn't connect with before. Um, mm -hmm. We had had a small, we had about 50 partners that we were working with regularly uh, up until the pandemic began. And then we just decided that we weren't going to turn anyone away. We weren't going to turn any organization that had need away. And that allowed us to reach families that we, from who were in communities that we had not worked in, um, that were getting support from organizations that we had not worked with. And that allowed those families to have more of that holistic support that we're looking for. Um, but it's also been wonderful to, to connect with other nonprofits that have aligned missions so we can think creatively together um, that, you know, that the one and one is more than two, but it's three and four. And that's something we've really had to do to be able to um, reach more people. I mean, we, we also are finding these partnerships in unusual places. For example, we have a school bus company. So we, we don't have our own fleet of um, delivery vans. We have a lot of product that we need to get out and we have a school bus company that has spare time. And so they deliver for us once a week. Um, and so it's those kind of wonderful connections that we've been able to leverage to be able to reach more families. And, and they're not the only ones. We had a valet company that was doing that for us in the height of the lockdown. Um, and I'm sure that there, my colleagues have other stories that are similar to that. Thank you. All right, Brooke, I bet you've got one. Yeah, I think let's, um, let's take a look at the questions that are coming in from the audience now. Um, Christy Uchida, um, apologies if I pronounced that wrong. Um, what is the best way for nonprofits to cultivate and get connected to donor advised funds? Somebody take that one for us. Sure, I can take that one. And, and then Ramsey, maybe you might want to chime in as well. Um, this is a question we often get. Um, and, you know, donor advised funds are usually housed um, somewhere, right? Um, whether it be at um, Bank of America or Fidelity or your local community foundation and so forth, or Charles Schwab. So, um, they're usually um, managed uh, and um, kind of looked over, particularly in the, in the community foundation space, um, by a philanthropic advisor team. Um, and um, they are, um, you know, usually ones who are doing research on organizations, um, who know the key players, particularly with the community foundations. Community foundations tend to know um, the heartbeat of, of the nonprofit. So if there's a local community foundation, and, and there is um, in Chicago, um, you know, if there's a connection to make, um, let folks there know about the organization. And what we always say is start with who's in your family first. Um, because you may have some of your um, most uh, generous donors, ambassadors, who happen to have donor advised funds. Um, but you may not know that. And um, a lot of folks use donor advised funds to give anonymously. So if there's a way for you as a nonprofit to share information with your regular donor base, um, something key you're doing, something, an initiative that might be a, um, a, a matching grant possibility, for example. Um, a lot of folks use their donor advised funds to use the matching grant op um, option. Um, it's a great way to get the word out there with ambassadors who are already your donors. Um, that's something I've actually seen, um, you know, 
be successful um, in the community for fundraising. And, um, um, and again, your local community foundation can be a, a nice conduit to that um, and help spread the word. So can I also jump on, on that? Because Misty, from an organization, a nonprofit side, um, it's such a good question because DAF funds are, are really where we're starting to see a lot more um, donations come in. Uh, I think between that and, and bequests, um, those are really where on the foundation side we're seeing it. So I would recommend, um, you know, first you need to be able to get your brand out to the community. And then you need to ask, as Misty says, ask the questions, because there's so many individuals now who have DAF funds, and, and the goal is to use that. And, and it's managed really well. Um, they get a, a good benefit from it, as Ramsey says, and, and so does the organization. I think the one difficult piece for it from a, a nonprofit side is if you have a multi-year commitment to a capital campaign, and it comes from a DAF fund, and if it was, you know, 100,000 over four years, we can't realize the 100,000, we can realize the 25, because the DAF needs to every year reassess that. It's just a, it's just a small piece of what it is, but it's, it's a great area for, for fundraising, and I think it's an important piece to think about moving forward. Thank you, Shelley. And um, just as a highlight too, we've got a wonderful place for to, to shout from the mountaintops, every matching grant in excess of $10,000 or more. So um, look for that on our website. And if you're looking for those opportunities or if you want to promote an opportunity, we'd love to hear more about that and get that um, elevated quickly and message through our better letter as well. Ramsey, I found a quick question for you. Um, can Bank, uh, Bank of America please give more specific advice around helping and planning next generation family philanthropy meetings? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to tackle that. It probably will fall a little bit more over into, into Misty's category. Uh, we, it is not uncommon whether it's philanthropy or just wealth education for us to, uh, you know, we may start off with a relationship with uh, one generation, but we certainly, for, for lots of reasons, want to bring in the next generation and talk with them. I've had the pleasure of working with some families now for over four generations, and that's uh, cause I, just because I've been around for a long time, and, mm -hmm. and that is very, very rewarding to help educate the next generation <clears throat> over things that could be, you know, saving for college or, or you know, just, just any number of topics. And of course, I think over the years that it's been viewed that philanthropy is a great way to involve the next generations and incidentally, not just educate them about philanthropy, but also to educate them about, you know, uh, financial aspects too, as far as, you know, uh, you know, if it's a foundation or even a donor advice fund that you can run like a foundation, you know, you ought to have a budget, you ought to do your due diligence, you need to, you need to be thoughtful about what you're doing and not just, not just be reactive uh, to things. So, uh, we do that all the time. I used to have one family, and, and unfortunately, the patriarchs passed away. We used to meet, and I live in Texas, and, and they would always come from all around the country to come to the Texas State Fair. And so on Saturday morning, we would have the family meetings, and there would be, you know, like four generations there, and the, and the patriarchs, and then five kids, and a blended family, and then grandkids, and they put all the grandkids off and have babysitters take care of them, and we pick different topics. And we would meet and we would spend half the day together on Saturdays. And they'd always be apologetic to me to, to say, that's for sorry to take up your Saturday. And I said, look, I would rather spend 50 Saturdays a month doing family meetings. You know, I could take off Wednesday afternoons to make up for it if that's what, what it needs to be. But I love to do family meetings. I think it's the most important part of the thing that we do to help spread that education from, you know, maybe a founding generation down to, you know, the kids and the grandkids and, there's so many uh, great different ways to do that. So we love to do that. We do it all the time. Terrific. Thank you for that. There is a, a quick question for you as well. Just a clarification question from one of our audience members. Uh, Ramsey, could you repeat the statement about the full deductibility of cash gifts in 2020? Okay, there's a special rule. Normally, uh, and I'm going to give you a three-tiered answer here. Uh, until the 2017 tax act. So before 2018, if you gave cash to a public charity, 
you could deduct 100% of it up to 50% of your adjusted gross income. In 2018 and 2019, that changed. You could go up to, you know, again, 100% of it, up to 60% of your adjusted gross income if all the gifts were made in cash. If you gave away even one non-cash gift, one share of stock, uh, one whatever, anything other than cash, then you came back down to that 50% level. This year, you could still do uh, what you could do before, but you could add on top of that, you could go all the way up to the top to 100% of your income, as long as that additional amount that you do is in cash to an operating charity. So for example, you could give it to any of the three charities mentioned here, which are public operating charities. Uh, in many, many, there's 1.4 million operating charities in America. If you gave them cash, you could go all the way up to 100% uh, of, your, of your income uh, and, and, and take that as a deduction. That's a this year opportunity. We don't know what's going to happen next year. If there's an, another stimulus bill either passed this year or next year, there will be. But we just don't know when or how much. I think there's a pretty good chance that they'll continue that 100%. And it's even though it was passed as part of COVID relief, it's not limited to COVID. It can be to any public operating charity. Can't go to a donor advice fund, can't go to a private foundation. Hope that clarifies it. Can at I, least points I, out the, the need that, that you need to have an advisor involved who understands these rules, because there because there are layers and layers of rules. Right, Shoshana? I just wanted to jump in because I remember Ramsey previously was in referencing this was talking about if you're debating when to give, um, should it, should you give this year, should you give next year? You know, there are these reasons um, from the financial side about giving this year, the tax side about giving this year. I would just also add from the yeah. need side that giving this year, and I think we've all made this case that the expenses that beyond the need, we see this dramatic need. We also see a dramatic increase in expenses to try to address the challenges we're all facing. And then we know that um, many people and many corporations have are not able to give. So for those who can, if you are having that debate, let me, let me implore you to not debate too long that, that really this year is the year. No question about that. Okay, we have a, um, let's try to get to, I think maybe we can do two, one to two more audience um, questions. And this one, it looks like it would be great to get a response um, maybe from both our philanthropy partners and Bank of America team. Um, Karen Yanis says, emerging generation members tend to be interested in impact investing. Are there cross-sector ways that nonprofits can benefit from profit investing? Can I get some volunteers here to take that one? Maybe we should first define what impact investing is for people who don't know. Uh, and it's different from socially responsible investing where you would put a screen on and say, um, I want you to invest my money, but I don't want anything invested in tobacco or hydrocarbons or guns or something like that. Uh, that's still out there. That's called SRI. But impact investing is that I actually want to invest in such a way that, that the actual investments will also uh, reflect and carry out my philanthropic purpose. Uh, and certainly that is more and more popular as we move into people who are, who are uh, more mission driven as opposed to institutionally driven in their charitable giving, which I think, you know, the greatest generation and I'm a baby boomer and we were all about institutional giving. And then you move into the millennials and the, and the generation X, Y, Z, and I think we've run out of letters, uh, they are much, much more uh, driven by mission type investing that I wanna, uh, it, and it may not be different. The money may go the same place, but they're just gonna have a different focus. But they want their investments uh, to not just get them a good return, but they want their investments to also uh, influence uh, their, their philanthropic mission. I think, I, Misty, is that a fair, description would you say of impact investing yeah um, absolutely it's 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 kind of that shift from we we don't want to not only not be harmful but we want to be positively impactful um, and making that 
impact investment decision um, proactively um, based on their values. So, um, you know, Ramsey beautifully just described the, the investment part of it. Uh, we've also seen a, a rise of um, conscious consumerism, like really looking at what am I buying? What service am I um, partaking in? What's the um, labor chain? What's the service delivery? Um, you know, what is the um, impact that that's happening? So it, it, particularly with the next generation philanthropists, we see this quite a bit. Um, you know, worked with a lot of um, meetings where it, it really, you know, it's actually a great way to get different generations involved because, again, it comes from maybe in a previous generation saying, oh, we just don't want to fund in ba 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 And then the younger generation saying, yes, but we do want to fund in this. Um, so, um, you know, that, that back and forth, it really just makes for much better philanthropy as well. Well, and I would add to that, just looking at, at the three of us and our nonprofits, it, it, you, you, you have nothing better for impact. You, you, you have clothing, you have crisis, right? And you have health. And, and so, uh, you know, if you looked at the three organizations that are represented here, um, there's a lot of impact that, that donors will find with their, their dollars. I, I think you two would agree. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's why I think this is special. Shoshana? I was just gonna say, I think it's, I think that um, lens of impact investing is a great part of a portfolio. Um, and I'm putting a little hat on, I did work in the philanthropy field on the other side of the table um, before I was here um, working at Cradles. And so I worked with families who are interested in impact investing. And I think that's wonderful. And I just encourage people to think about it as one tool in like a larger toolbox, right? So mm -hmm. there are many ways you can have that impact. And if you're interested in a topic like environmental issues or housing or small businesses or workforce development, there's a ton of opportunity for impact investing in those fields. Um, but I think we, one also has to remember that there are also immediate needs that need to be taken care of as well that aren't necessarily going to be addressed um, with impacting and so impact investing. So you can look at the issues that are important to you and take a whole portfolio viewpoint of, um, you know, the long game and some ways you're going to address it through impact investing and other ways you can address it through grants or volunteerism or board service or whatnot. You know what, um, thank you for those questions. Brooke, is there anything else? Yeah, you know, we have one more question that I would love to get to, so let's make this our last one. Um, JR is, says, I am currently a college student studying business, but I really want to work in the nonprofit sector. What is the best way for me to get involved, not just as a basic volunteer, but in the management and finances of nonprofit institutions? And all of you have mentioned, you know, your paths a little bit. Um, Selena, do you want to talk a little bit about how you got to where you are and give some advice here? Sure. So one of the first things that just immediately, you know, came to my came to mind was just being involved in some of the junior auxiliary boards that are with some of our organizations is just a really significant way to already get involved in the governance and kind of understanding. You know, I think one of the most powerful things that I, you know, about the mission of the American Red Cross is that we actually go out and we provide the service before actually having the dollars to do it. So if you have to shelter 50,000 people or if you have to respond to a home fire in Illinois, we respond to three to four home fires every single day. We're going out and doing that before actually already having the dollars to do it and then just banking on the generosity of the American public uh, to pay us back for that. And, and they so often do and it's, it's a really powerful thing. But that would be probably one of the first things in terms of thinking about just being a general volunteer, and we really do need people um, with all different skill sets to be able to assist with the different types of challenges um, that organizations are currently seeing in this environment. I'd like to add to that that um, come along, <laughs> come come to Lurie Children's because uh, we 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 are building a pipeline. We are. Um, really deeply in, in uh, conversations about equity, diversity, and inclusion as all, all companies and organizations are doing now. Um, we have a workforce education through our healthy communities um, that really tries to educate 
the teenagers and young adults of Chicago about what it's like to be in healthcare. Um, and that is, part of it is nonprofit and finance, what, what the question is. And, and we're doing a virtual career day. So if, if he would like to, or I can't remember their name, if they'd like to be a part of that, that's January 27th and it's a virtual career day. So I think there are many ways that nonprofits are reaching out to our communities to get them involved because they're our next generation. Ramsey talks about it from the financial side. We talk it from a nonprofit side. We want the next generation to take over. We want them to, to be philanthropically based and forward thinking that way. Um, I just, I, I can't say enough about that. Please come and, and try to join and ask a lot of questions. Beautiful, Thank you all for that. Ramsey, I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention an increasing number of schools, and you may check at your own school, have minors and now majors in nonprofit management. It is an actual course of study, and that used to be pretty limited, but I think that's really, really expanding. Uh, Misty mentioned that uh, uh, the, the nonprofit sector is the third largest employer in the country, so, and that's not going to shrink. Uh, it, it's going to stay there or even get bigger, so uh, more and more schools will also be offering that as a formal education, you know, opportunity. Indeed, thank you. You know, before we close, we'd like to also acknowledge Tiana Zubek and our wonderful partner at Laura Tiana here today. Thank you, I know you've been um, there on the screen and listening along. Laura Piano has actually generously joined this program as a philanthropy partner with a special offer and they are delighted to invite our webinar guests, all of you listening today, to a charity shopping event beginning tomorrow, Thursday the 19th, all the way through Tuesday, December 1st, which happens to be Giving Tuesday. Laura Piano will donate 10% of proceeds in store to this evening's philanthropy partners, American Red Cross Tiffany Circle, Cradles to Crowns Chicago, and Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. Just mention Better Family Philanthropy event to participate and you will receive beautiful invitation with details tomorrow in your email with all the particulars. And I think that's a wrap, Brooke. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today, especially our keynote speakers from Bank of America Private Bank, our philanthropy partners, and Tiana from Laurel Piana. It's great to see you all. While we of course all wish we could be gathered together in person, we are grateful for everyone's collaboration on this virtual program with an audience that we've actually had long logged on spanning the country. We hope that you'll continue to engage with us digitally on our social media platforms and by sharing our content that's coming to you via our Better Letter. We'll be sharing links to help you do that in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving after this, as well as we'll be sharing um, the recorded presentation too, so you can follow up on um, anything that you wanted to revisit from tonight. And we look forward to the time when we can again come together in person. And in the meantime, we wish you a safe, healthy, and happy Thanksgiving and holiday season. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.